I'm Brent Glass, Executive Director of the Sing Sing Prison Museum, based in Ossining, New York. Uh, the museum is still in its virtual phase, uh, but when we open, we will be the extraordinary location uh, where the complex and compelling stories of incarceration are shared at one of America's most historic prisons. A site of self-reflection and learning, the museum challenges all of us to imagine a more equitable criminal justice system and to take action to build a better society. This mission inspires tonight's program, COVID-19 and incarceration, which is part of a webinar series called Justice Talks. We are grateful to the team of staff and board members led by Sam North and Victoria Gonzalez for producing these webinars. And we're also grateful to tonight's sponsor, AMEND, at the University of California, San Francisco. Please look out for future webinar announcements. Our next one, I believe, will be on October 13th. Now I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Kimberly Calico Cox, who will serve as moderator for our program. Dr. Cox is an associate professor of criminal justice and security at Pace University's Dyson, Dyson College of Arts and Sciences. She holds degrees in criminal justice from John Jay College for Criminal Justice and the City University of New York. She has spent her career as a teacher, author, and community leader working with incarcerated men and women and with students. Uh, throughout her career. In 2018, she received the prestigious National Jefferson Award for public service. Dr. Cox. Hi, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much. Thank you, Brent. Uh, my name is Dr. Kimberly Kalika Cox, and I am a criminal justice professor with Pace University, serving both our Westchester and our New York City campuses. I'm delighted to be here tonight with all of the participants who have wanted to take on this very important topic dealing with COVID-19 and our incarcerated population. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background um, on myself, uh, Brent had given a, a little overview. I've been working with incarcerated populations for approximately 23 years, uh, first starting working with HIV um, and incarcerated women, but I actually taught my very first class at Sing Sing Correctional Facility, so the Sing Sing Museum is, is very dear to my heart. Um, currently now, as part of my position at PACE, I am directing the Parenting Prison and Pups Program, which is a partnership that we hold with the Metropolitan Correctional Center and also the Westchester County Department of Corrections. It's a program where we are providing um, evidence-based parenting skills to incarcerated women that is integrated with the use of animal-assisted therapy. And just recently, we are providing an inside-out program at the Westchester County Department of Corrections, where we have PACE students who are taking college credit courses with incarcerated men and women at the Westchester Jail. And that program is a affiliated with the International Inside Out program um, at Temple University. So we're very happy to be able to offer uh, those services. Um, for those of us who have worked in corrections, we have obviously been um, on the front lines of what has been going on in terms of this, this virus. We have seen um, friends and family who have become ill and of course become sick and have also passed away. It has been very devastating um, for many people. I will say for myself, we have been quite lucky um, in my family. Uh, I was not infected with COVID. Uh, my husband, who's a sergeant at the Westchester County Department of Corrections also was not infected. But my brother, who's a correctional nurse uh, at Sullivan Correctional, he did contract COVID. And my son-in-law, who's a correctional officer at Greenhaven contracted COVID as well well. And luckily, everyone has recovered. So my story is better um, than some of our others. But many of my colleagues during this time have lost family members, and it's been particularly devastating. Before we begin, just to sort of give us some context um, about where we've been and where we are, um, it was only in January, right, a little less than nine months ago, where the World Health Organization basically said that COVID-19 is a health emergency of international concern. And just this week, um, as you've probably seen on the news, we've passed this very grim milestone of 200,000 related COVID deaths in the United States, becoming the country with the highest number of deaths. 
Um, more people have died basically in the United States from COVID infection than any other country. And at the peak of infection, New York was hit especially hard where we had approximately 800 people who were dying every single day. We know that anytime there is a communicable illness in the community, it poses significant problems and challenges uh, for corrections administrators where social distancing is often very difficult and the environment can serve as an incubator for the virus. It was in March in 2020 of this year that Governor Cuomo signed executive order number 202 declaring a disaster emergency here in New York State followed nine days later by um, a declaration of emergency in our own Westchester County by County Executive George Latimer. Um, by September 15th, if we look at what the statistics have been in terms of incarcerated populations, and I thank the, the Marshall Project uh, for pro providing these up-to-date statistics on their website. When we look at what's been going on in corrections, we have right now 125,730 prisoners who have tested positive for COVID, um, and including that is 1,066 deaths. Looking at correctional staff, 27,632 prison staff, including 77 deaths as a relate of COVID infection. Taking it down to New York State, we have seen 755 cases with 17 deaths among our incarcerated population and 1,325 staff who have tested positive with five related deaths. These are not just numbers. These are people who are mothers and fathers and sisters and uncles and people who are loved by those who live in the community. And I think correctional administrators have had a very difficult challenge during this pandemic, not just because it's something that we have not seen, um, but because they have tried to provide essential services to a population that is in need of services because they suffer from things like high rates of mental illness and drug use, um, physical ailments, and there are essential services that needed to be provided. However, we also needed to take steps in order to mitigate transmission of the virus. So hopefully from this panel, what you're gonna see is in part one, you're gonna talk a little bit about the current state of COVID inside of US correctional facilities. And then in part two, we're gonna look at the way COVID has been handled and whether or not it's been handled correctly or incorrectly um, throughout the country in terms of how the Department of Corrections has dealt with this problem. And then we'll see about lessons that we've learned and moving forward on what we are going to go forward and do. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first panel um, who is comprised of three very esteemed panelists tonight. Um, our first panelist is Dr. Homer Venters. He is a physician and epidemiologist and a nationally recognized leader in health and human rights. He's involved in reducing traumatic brain injury among detainees and staff, as well as promoting access to evidence-based addiction treatment. He is the Senior Health and Justice Fellow for Community-Oriented Correctional Health Services, which frames correctional facilities as part of community health care rather than being viewed as a separate entity. They provide technical assistance and health information technology to improve correctional health care. He himself has led over 50 peer-reviewed articles, which have also been cited by the Supreme Court. Welcome, Dr. Venters. Our second panelist is Dr. Bree Williams. She's the founder and director of AMEND at the University of California, San Francisco. AMEND is an organization that is committed to changing correctional culture and brings a public health approach emphasizing dignity and humanity for staff and residents. Dr. Williams serves as a professor of medicine in the Division of Geriatrics in the, as the director of the Criminal Justice and Health Program, and she has developed new methods for responding to the unique health needs of criminal justice involved older adults, including an evidence-based approach to reforming compassionate release policies. She's also designed a new tool to assess physical functioning in older prisoners. She has served as, expert, as an expert witness and provided testimony to the United States Sentencing Commission on changes to compassionate release policy. Welcome, Dr. Williams. And our final panelist is Roy Austin, who is an attorney and a partner for Harris, Wiltshire and Granis, which is a boutique firm that focuses on solving serious legal problems. Mr. Austin is a nationally prominent trial and civil rights attorney who spent 15 years as a federal prosecutor and supervisor. He served as a deputy assistant attorney general in the US Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division. He was also the deputy assistant to President Barack Obama for the Office of Urban Affairs, Justice and Opportunity. He maintains an active civil rights practice representing clients, including the family of victims who have experienced violations of their fundamental constitutional rights. He has tried over 30 jury trials and argued cases around the country in the state, federal, administrative, appellate and state Supreme Courts. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Austin. All right. So thank you to everyone for joining. And we are going to begin with our first question. And our first question is for Dr. Venters. Um, Dr. Venters, you have been traveling around the country, entering prison facilities and detention centers. Can you please provide us with some examples of what you are seeing regarding the spread of COVID-19? Sure. Um, so hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. I apologize for the poor light in my hotel room in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, I've just been in the prisons here doing COVID inspections. Um, I should quickly say that I'm no longer with coaches. Uh, the nonprofit actually in April, I left so that I could do nothing uh, but COVID investigations full time. So since that time, I've been involved in about 50 jurisdictions around the country and physically inspected about 15 uh, ICE detention centers, uh, state prisons, BOP facilities, um, and county jails. And so um, I just would make a couple of quick observations. Um, I think one is that there are many people that uh, have this label as uh, recovered, uh, or we who uh, we think don't have active problems because of COVID, who actually have profound problems with COVID, uh, persisting symptoms. Uh, I've been in facilities where 80 or 90 percent of the people had had COVID, but it was months ago. And uh, you know, in these investigations, I've probably talked to two or 300 people so far who are incarcerated, and uh, many of the people who had COVID still have symptoms of shortness of breath, of weakness, of daily headaches, of ringing in the ears. Uh, but the way that our health systems are set up in jails and prisons, once they're out of medical isolation and the active concern about them being infectious to others uh, goes away, uh, there's very little or no documentation or care for them. Uh, the other thing I would uh, just put out there is that um, we have this idea that because the CDC has given us some guidance around the response to COVID-19, um, that we can copy and paste community infection control standards into jails and prisons and ICE detention settings, and it's simply not working. It's not working because correctional officers aren't healthcare providers, they haven't been trained in infection control. It's not working because of the physical plan, um, but also it's really not working because before COVID ever started, um, people didn't really have access to sick call the way a policy says that they're gonna get a response within 24 hours. They don't really have access to chronic care for their asthma, their COPD, uh, their diabetes, the way that those policies say they do. So the pre-existing uh, failures of correctional health care and their failures all across the country because we've left this part of our, our, our health care apparatus away from our quality uh, measurements, our quality uh, institutions, um, that really has made it uh, basically impossible to implement the type of infection control practices that the CDC envisions in these guidelines and that a lot of people think are really happening. So I'll stop there and and hand it off, but um, thrilled to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next question is for Mr. Roy Austin. In April, you and two others wrote in the New York Daily News that thousands of Americans who live and work in our federal prisons are at grave risk for COVID-19 and their federal government is not moving quickly enough to protect them. Since you wrote that article, how has the situation changed? Thank you for the invitation, and I, I appreciate being a part of this conversation, and the situation hasn't changed significantly. I mean, this, the situation has changed in, in this country, and so far as it's gotten worse, uh, so far as the, uh, the problem with COVID-19 has gotten worse, and as people have grown increasingly uh, lax in the protections that they're taking, that they're taking. Uh, look, we, we have a over-incarceration problem in the United States. We've had a healthcare system uh, in general that has been troubled, but the healthcare system in our prisons and jails has been uh, poor to, to say the best and horrific to say the worst. And of course, where you have something like COVID-19 in places that are not necessarily clean, in places where we have um, individuals in very close quarters, uh, where people do not have the ability to socially distant distance themselves from each other, you're going to have a bigger problem. And what we have seen is we've seen a few uh, reform-minded uh, elected prosecutors who have decided that they're not going to uh, fill the prisons and jails with uh, low-level uh, offenders, that they are going to work with the system to release low-level offenders as early as possible. Um, because we, we've got to lower the, the number of people who are incarcerated. And we're doing this 
and we're not seeing any significant increase in crime as a result of the people who are locked up. So while who were locked up and, and who are now being released. And so, you know, what we have seen here and the lesson that we have learned here is number one, we, we incarcerate too many people. Two, the facilities in which we incarcerate them in are, uh, are inhumane uh, in many situations. Three, we have an administration that continues to ignore that population largely and is not doing uh, what it should be doing for that population. Or uh, if you don't feel that those people deserve to have uh, safety and security and health, then the, the people who have to go in there day in and day out and work there. And so three, we have an administration that's not doing enough. But four, what we're seeing is we just don't have to lock up as many people as we have been. And that will hopefully be the lasting lesson that we take from all of this, uh, including uh, in addition to just improving the healthcare that these individuals face. And then also, I, I'm just gonna throw in five as a, as a bonus, the people who we are releasing, we're releasing them into their community and not necessarily testing them to ensure that they are not taking COVID into their communities. And I think we have to do a better job with respect to that as well. So uh, I give the current situation somewhere in the range of a, of a D minus um, for the, the effort and the improvement since that article was written. Thank you. And you, would you agree with the ACLU report? Did you see that report uh, that they published where they gave failing grades to most of the correctional institutions looking at certain criteria like lack of PPP, <laughs> lack of testing? Well, I, I guess I, I am a high grader if uh, the ACLU gave him a failing grade and I gave him a D minus. Um, so to that extent, I guess we, we don't agree, but, but no, I, look, I, I, I obviously agree uh, with that report and, and their findings. Um, I was trying to give a little bit of credit for the fact that some people have been released early, um, but beyond that, what we're seeing is, is truly horrific. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Um, our next question for Dr. Williams. Uh, Dr. Williams, what has the San Quentin prison situation taught us about preventing and managing infectious disease outbreak? Thanks. Well, first, uh, I'd just like to join my panel, fellow panelists in saying thank you so much for having me. Um, I really applaud the museum's efforts to highlight the experiences of people living and working through the COVID-19 pandemic in prisons and in jails. You know, what is unfolding, I would echo uh, Mr. Austin to say what's unfolding in real time is part of the devastating and important history of mass incarceration in America. And um, I think we're going to look back on this time with true horror at what has happened for people who are incarcerated, uh, staff who work in prisons and family members and loved ones in the community. So um, I think not just focusing on San Quentin, but really focusing on Many of the prisons um, and prison systems that our team has been um, working with, supporting, trying to work as thought partners with um, to figure out a better way to respond uh, to the, to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd say that there are several public health lessons in the first six months that we can take away um, that cannot eradicate the risk of catastrophic future COVID-19 outbreaks, but hopefully minimize them. And the first one, as both of my other panelists have said, is decarcerate. We just, we have to reduce the population. We've been saying this since late February. Um, many of us have been saying this for years, but certainly in a respiratory pandemic, this is absolutely necessary. We have to reduce the population in congregate settings, including in prisons and jails, so that we can enable physical or social distancing. And this is going to require a national reckoning with mass incarceration. We're seeing that jails are doing a pretty good job of this and prisons are really not, uh, not picking up the slack and not following suit in many, in many states, although there are certainly some, um, some outliers. What COVID-19 has taught us, uh, if it hasn't taught us anything at all other than this, is that prisons cannot operate at or even close to 100% capacity. In a situation like this, an emergency situation like this, medical leadership has to have the space to create physical distancing and flexible space to be able to turn living areas, making them bigger or making them smaller into quarantine and medical isolation units when they need it. Um, and then that goes into some, one of the second things that we've really learned um, in the last six months is that we have to develop ethical guidelines for the differences between medical isolation, the difference between medical isolation and quarantine, and the difference between both of those things and 
prolonged punitive solitary confinement, which is really what's being used in many prisons and jails across the country instead of quarantine and medical isolation. And it actually undermines the ability for the prisoner or jail to control the pandemic because people are not truthful about their symptoms or exposures for fear of being housed in this type of horrible situation. I think we have to improve occupational health. So everything from universal screening, but also paid sick days. A lot of, a lot of um, staff members that we're learning about, either full-time employees or contract employees do not have paid sick leave. And so are not, um, are not incentivized to say if they've been exposed or having symptoms. Um, we need hoteling for people to stay in during outbreaks to keep their families safe. We need centralized outbreak response teams basically to support the healthcare staff on the ground so that they can take care of patients and a, and a system that comes from the outside that knows how to think about ventilation and sanitation and patient flow and resident and staff cohorting and testing, those can come into the system and support the healthcare professionals there who are trying to do their job of keeping people alive. And then I would say, um, you know, a couple other things is really making it clear to community hospitals that are taking care of enormous numbers of patients suddenly that they have not been used to in the past um, from that are transferred from prisons and jails. You know, a lot of community healthcare professionals, professionals have never taken care of a person who is transferred from prison or jail and they don't know if they have what their rights are. You know, they don't know that they can sign a do not resuscitate form. They can. They don't know that they can that they can call their families, that they have a right to self-determination to make decisions about what kind of health care they get. And so we really need to make it clear what uh, to community healthcare professionals, what the rights are um, for the ethical care of people who are incarcerated. And finally, um, and I think both of my other um, colleagues spoke to this as well, is that correctional system leadership has to be actively partnering with residents and their family members on the outside to identify meaningful solutions. This is not gonna be a top-down plan that's gonna work. We need, we need to have people who are living and working in these facilities 24 seven to have ownership and uh, value in the decision-making process about how to keep their, their home and their workplace safe. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Our next question for Mr. Austin, have racial and ethnic disparities in incarceration become evident in the spread of COVID-19 inside of prisons? And if so, how? How have you seen this play out? You know, it's playing out in the same way that it's playing out in, in the real world, is the, uh, the number, first of all, we have um, over-incarcerated black and brown men and women uh, for decades um, disproportionate to their, uh, their presence in the, in the community. Uh, and you uh, add on top of that, the frequency of, uh, of black and brown individuals of having uh, health uh, situations that make them more susceptible to COVID-19. And then you lock them up in a, in a prison or jail uh, where they cannot socially distance, where there is a lack of health care um, in general. And so it is my understanding that the numbers that we are seeing and the impact on the black and brown community that is incarcerated uh, is, is similar to, if not worse than, what we are seeing uh, out, in the, out in the general public. And what we're seeing in the general public, to the extent that we are keeping track of the demographic information of those who are being most impacted um, is clearly racially disproportionate. Um, and so uh, one would only expect that to be, uh, you know, many fold in our prisons and jails, uh, which, you know, you take a population that you have people who already, uh, that some people already don't care sufficiently about, don't humanize enough, and then you add color to that um, and, uh, the ability for them to advocate and to get changes made uh, takes some real courage. And we certainly aren't seeing that courage by much of the leadership in the country. Thank you. Um, Dr. Venters, the next question is for you. Uh, your unique experience as chief medical officer at Rikers Island allows you to speak to the challenges of preventing the spread of disease and delivering medical care within this type of setting. 
How have these unique circumstances posed challenges to containing the spread of COVID-19? Well, I think that it's important to recognize the huge amount of effort that's gone into slowing the spread uh, in most correctional settings. And it's important to recognize it, not because I think or an objective analysis would say it's enough, but to say a lot of work is going in every place I've looked, the correctional administrators, the health folks are doing a lot of things. But one of the things that these settings are completely lacking is any sense of what's the numerator and what's the denominator. And so when it comes to healthcare, it means we can always get a list of all the stuff that got done and you can get a list from every jail and prison about all the you know, cleaning supplies they bought, about all the, the, the memos and signage they posted, uh, but you never really can get a sense of the denominator, which is what should they have done? What did they need to do? And that doesn't exist for a reason. And the reason is these are not accountable or transparent institutions, certainly not with regard to the healthcare. Um, so one of the big barriers to slowing the spread, obviously, is the physical plant. Uh, as Dr. Williams said, it's vital to decant or to have fewer people in each institution, not only to allow for the creation of quarantine and medical isolation units, but to have half or fewer people in a housing area than originally designed so that people can have some hope in social distance. But a great example, I saw a question about this has to do with masks. You know, I've gone all over from like Florida, all the way up to New York and Connecticut over to California. And one of the consistent things I hear is that uh, on the nights and the weekends, officers don't wear masks. Uh, supervisors come in during the day and they put a mask on. Um, I have yet to come into contact with people that are doing basic quality assurance about whether or not officers are wearing masks. And that's possible with video surveillance. You could review uh, a subset of video surveillance to see. Uh, instead, most places have a, an approach that unless a staff member sees another staff member not wear a mask, it's not really credible for uh, instituting a disciplinary action. So what it does is it completely puts aside or ignores the voice of the people who are being affected by this, uh, which is incarcerated people. Uh, it also then erodes any engagement about the other infection control issues. So uh, I think that the lack of quality assurance, basic standards and metrics in how we implement whatever the task is. Uh, it's pre-existing, but it also makes it very hard or very difficult the implementation of anything new uh, for more than a couple of weeks. Have you also seen reluctance on the part of incarcerated men and women in terms of wearing their masks? Sure, I mean, I just, you know, this report is public, so I can say this. I was just in Farmville, Virginia, where that ICE detention center has about 90% of people had COVID. Uh, that COVID outbreak was caused by uh, the transfer of people into the facility and pushing aside the normal uh, new admission quarantine process. Uh, and so when I got to that facility, uh, you know, everybody there got COVID because it was introduced to them. They were subjected to COVID. So they all had it. Some of them got sick. Uh, a gentleman from Canada, an older man died. Um, and so now all of a sudden, because it's in the press, the facility, uh, and I wrote this in my report, is implementing uh, mask wearing. And the response when I asked the people who were detained, uh, what do you think about this? They were like, why should we put on a mask or do anything they say when they let us, they actually subjected us to COVID and the result is we got sick and, so, and one of us died. And so that lack of empathy and engagement with the people who are incarcerated is more toxic to infection control than any other like policy uh, problem that I've seen. Thank you so much, Dr. Venters. Um, our last question is for Dr. Williams. Uh, Dr. Williams, what can be done to better protect correctional officers and all staff in their places of work? And why is this so important to consider correctional staff as well as our incarcerated population? Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I touched on this a little bit, but um, for many, uh, for many years, many states have not had adequate occupational health, meaning programs uh, for staff that uh, are specifically focused on their health and well-being. Correctional officers have oftentimes many of the same sky-high rates of medical conditions, including sort of what we call the bread and butter conditions of self-destruction, diabetes, hypertension, heart failure. People have very high rates of substance use disorders and exceptional rates of 
of early suicide. And so before COVID-19, the occupational health of correctional officers was suffering. I think um, what COVID-19 has taught us is that there was really not a lot of backfill in terms of uh, having a plan and a support structure to optimize the care um, during something like in a worldwide pandemic, which you know we, we very much knew was eventually gonna happen. And so a lot of systems have found themselves scrambling to figure out what do we do with officers who don't have health insurance? Can we provide them with testing? If they get testing from their primary care doctor, what are the rights and responsibilities of the officer or of the doctor to, to provide uh, the prison with the results of that testing? Should the prison be testing people? Do the doctors at the prison who are charged with taking care of the patients in the prison also take on the responsibility of testing and notifying the officers there? Obviously, it's all interconnected in terms of, in terms of infection control. And so I think what we're seeing is this need um, in the absence of you know, a, a, a national plan around healthcare in general and around COVID in particular, it's sort of playing out in real time in the prisons where it's very unclear how to look at two populations who are all in, in the eyes of a virus <laughs> <laughs> the same and uh, and differentiate the different ways to be trying to provide care. And I, I would just say the, the final thing that I would just really want to underscore is hundreds of thousands of people of correctional officers and correctional staff and healthcare professionals are entering and exiting these facilities every day. And it's not like the high risk exposures in hospitals where a nurse or doctor walks into a room of a patient for 20 minutes or 30 minutes. I mean, people are spending eight hours, 12 hours, 16 hour shifts in sharing air all together. They're bringing infection in, they're bringing infection out. And so we have to find a way to protect the staff and to protect the people who are incarcerated from the illnesses, illness that comes in with the staff. We also have to find a way to give officers hoteling and other options during kind of hot spotting and outbreaks in facilities so that we can keep the community and their families safe as well. Thank you, Dr. Williams. I think you brought up a very interesting point um, earlier about jails doing a better job at controlling the uh, pandemic than prisons have. And I, I just wanted to take this opportunity to talk for a few minutes um, about one of the jails that I think has done a really excellent job, which was the Westchester County Department of Corrections in our own county. Um, under the leadership of Commissioner Spano and Deputy Commissioner Molina, they were actually able to bring their COVID rate down to zero. And it has stayed that way um, through a multifaceted approach, which I think can serve as a model um, for many other facilities. And of course, jails have a particular challenge because they have such a transient population. Um, and Dr. Venters was kind of talking a little bit about this with Rikers Island, but people who are coming and going, right? And not only posing a risk for those who come in, but then those who are released back to the community, right? Making sure that our communities um, remain safe. But I think it really is a concerted effort. Um, in Westchester, we really saw the Westchester government, the jail, uh, the district attorney's office, um, legal aid, really all came together um, to try to reduce the population, which was significantly helpful. Obviously, bail reform reduced our population significantly in Westchester, pretty much by half, where our population was down to about 500, so that we could discontinue the use of dormitory-style housing, um, which was extremely helpful. They were able to work with um, the district attorney's office and the Legal Aid Society in facilitating not only medical paperwork to help inmates um, be released early for COVID-related policies, um, about 65 were released in Westchester during that time, but they were able to assign six correctional officers full time so that the incarcerated could meet their court appointments, right, and see the judges and go through their, their arraignments and their hearings, and so there wouldn't be such a backup um, with all of those policies and processes. The testing, obviously very important. Um, I thought they did a really good job with quarantining, um, making sure that Anyone who was symptomatic um, or who attested positive did stay quarantined to protect both staff and, and uh, protect the rest of population. 
And Dr. Williams, you brought up really interesting points about protecting staff. And I think Westchester as a whole really did a great job um, in terms of dealing with correctional staff. One of the things that they did allow, so staff did not feel compelled to come in when they felt sick, just because they kind of wanted to you know, plow through and just, just come in and not have to take their sick time, was they allowed for a COVID sick leave. Um, you could just call in COVID sick and it did not count against your sick time. And then of course, if you had FMLA, it did not count against those hours um, as well. And I think that was really helpful. Um, at the peak of the pandemic, they must've had about 150 officers uh, who were out at that particular time, but they were not jeopardizing anybody's safety because they felt that they needed um, to come in. And then I think looking forward, one of the things that we may want to look at in terms of corrections is in order to provide services, especially if we do end up having um, a second wave, is trying to utilize more technology um, in the correctional environment. We were able to continue providing our college class through uh, the video platform, court services, mental health was still happening um, through St. John's Riverside. So there were a lot of programs that were able to happen because technology um, was in place. And I know correctional institutions are a little bit hesitant um, to utilize that technology, but it may be a way that we can still provide services while also continuing to minimize the risk of infection. So I want to thank all three of our panelists, Dr. Williams, Dr. Venters, and Mr. Austin. We really appreciate your insight. And we will be calling you back for the third part of the presentation where we will have open questions from our audience. Thank you so much. Now for our second part, I'd like to introduce our next three panelists. And we're at this particular point in time going to look at the way that COVID has been handled and whether it's been handled correctly or incorrectly um, in US prisons and jails. And what lessons can we take away basically from this analysis? So our first panelist, Ms. Chastity Bowman. Uh, welcome, Ms. Bowman. Um, she's a mother, she's a wife, she's a prison reform advocate for Ohio's Prisoners Justice League, which is an organization fighting for the fair and humane treatment of incarcerated persons with a focus on expanding opportunities for treatment and rehabilitation. She has been very outspoken during the pandemic and can speak from the perspective of having a loved one who's been incarcerated during this time. Thank you for joining us, Ms. Bowman. Our next panelist, who probably needs no introduction, Mr. Brian Fisher, uh, who is the former New York State Department of Corrections and C Community Supervision Commissioner and the former superintendent of Sing Sing, a Brooklyn native who started off as a parole officer, served as the superintendent at Sing Sing for seven years. And he served from 2007 to 2013 as the commissioner of the New York State Department of Corrections um, and Community Supervision. It was under his leadership that both the New York State Department of Corrections and the New York State Division of Parole were consolidated. New York State, as we know, is one of the largest prison systems in the United States, currently with 52 correctional facilities and slightly less than 55,000 residents. They supervise approximately 37,000 parolees and employ over 31,000 staff. He was responsible during his tenure for helping to downsize the department by closing farms, annexes, camps, and several medium security prisons. He earned Warden of the Year in 2006 and was honored by the New York State Bar Association for outstanding contributions in the fields of corrections in 2012. Thank you, Mr. Fisher, for joining us. And then our last panelist, um, who I'm actually a fan of and have cited your work in my own writing, uh, Mr. Lawrence Bartley, who is the Director of News Inside for the Marshall Project. And the Marshall Project is an award-winning publication, which educates the public about the criminal justice system and also about criminal justice policy. His publication is now in hundreds of prisons and jails throughout the country. He serves on the board of directors of the Prisoner Legal Services and Rehabilitation Through the Arts and on the advisory board for the Parole Preparation Project. He is an accomplished public speaker as well as an accomplished writer. Thank you, Mr. Bartley, for joining us. We're gonna begin with our first question uh, from Mr. Fisher. Mr. Fisher, as a former superintendent of Sing Sing, can you take us through some of the real life problems that developed as a result of the virus and how prisons have really had to adjust to this new reality? It's a good question and thank you for uh, inviting me. <clears throat> One of the problems I think Sing Sing and, and all the prisons have, have uh, 
taken on the task, if you would, is historically, we've been able to deal with small medical issues, TB, even AIDS, SARS. SARS. This, this epidemic, um, I think, came so fast and so widespread that clearly, and, and it's been basically stated earlier by the doctors, that the medical services were simply overwhelmed. No question about that. The added to that problem was the fact that in prisons, you don't have the ability to move people around as much as you'd like in terms of isolation and quarantine. So what they were faced with is among several problems, one of which clearly was what rules to follow. You've got the CDC rules, you've got the state health rules, you have governor's rules, and you go across the country, you've got different interpretations of what those rules are. So the guidelines, um, basically were considered um, workable to an extent, but clearly weren't designed for prisons. So what did prisons do and what have they done reasonably well, even though each situation, each change they made raised other problems. What they had to do and they did initially was basically to stop intake. Don't bring people in from the jails into the state prisons, which was great for the state prisons, but not necessarily good for the jails. Um, they stopped transfers. One of the things that clearly had to be done and uh, is being done to a, a better degree than, than before was don't transfer people around different systems or different institutions without testing. The other thing was, and this was a, a requirement that was basically required, but, but not favored or favorable, if you would, and that was the closing down of visiting, visiting and, and programs and volunteers. So you basically have shut down the systems. You close the, the prisons even more than they were before necessary. Um, then they began to do the testing. They began to do the mass. Um, and basically they tried to isolate the people in, in the system. What probably is what occurs in all the prisons is the, being, the overwhelming number of people that needed services and the inability of the service providers, especially the medical, the medical staff, to do that. Even testing, uh, like in the community, many of the prison systems across the state and across the country had problems getting testing equipment, had problems getting PPE uh, items. So you were faced with everything that community was faced with including finding a place for people to quarantine, you had that occurring inside the prisons. Um, and of course, the, 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 what they started to do and still are doing, but need to do more clearly, is can we release the vulnerable population? And the vulnerable population has to be identified. Clearly, pregnant women, in, in many cases, people over 55, 65, and, and medically ill individuals, all these factors came all at once. And the question becomes, what do you do when you're overwhelmed with the system? Probably the biggest issue that the jails and the prisons have faced is where do you and how do you quarantine those who are symptomatic? And how do you deal with tracing them in terms of the asymptomatic individuals? So the, the prisons are overwhelmed is probably the the honest answer to do, to, to, to make. Um, and I think they're doing the best they can in most cases, but some of the problems are gonna be information sharing. Do, does everybody know what the plan is? Is everybody moving in according to the same set of policies? So um, they have done well, but not well enough. Thank you, Mr. Fisher, appreciate that. Our second question is for Mr. Bartley. Um, Mr. Bartley, in your essay, How 27 Years in Prison Prepared Me for Coronavirus, you write about how you learn to adapt and improvise in the face of adversity. How do you think this is helping those inside now cope with the realities of COVID-19? Well, thank you for having me once again, um, Dr. Cox. Well, before masks were widely distributed in, in prisons throughout the country, people were learning to adapt by taking their t-shirts and cutting them out and making masks with it. Women in, in female facilities were using headscarves 
Some of them were even using tampons in order to make masks. So they were adapting in, in, in many different ways. Um, people who are in an incarcerated system, they are forced to adapt in order to get food when, when, when the facility is locked down. They're forced to adapt in order to, to when the water in the facility is shut off, they have to find means of, of taking a shower. Some of them um, use hot pots and, and get water from central areas and heat it up and, and, and wash up. So I have calls and, and letters from people all across the country with horror stories uh, that surrounded this pandemic and they found ways to adapt. Thank you, Mr. Bartley. Mm -hmm. Uh, our next question is for Ms. Chastity Bowman. Uh, Ms. Bowman, can you speak to your personal experience regarding the impact of COVID-19 on families of the incarcerated, as well as the impetus behind the creation of the Ohio Prisoners Justice League? Sure, um, it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you um, for this space in order um, to, that you guys have given me this evening. Um, so. Well, how Prisoners Justice League was formed in March of this year when the pandemic hit. My husband is currently incarcerated in one of the facilities here in Ohio. And so what we were experiencing were um, miscommunications and information from the Department of Corrections and from our governor. So several, women, several women, women, including myself, decided that we wanted to be more proactive than what we were seeing the state um, take any kind of measures immediately to um, try to avoid the widespread of COVID in our facilities. As you know, Marion Correctional Facility is number three in the country. Um, it's 98% overran and we have one case of COVID in every one of our facilities. So what we did was we began calling every facility every day. We had a list of questions that we would call concerning COVID, um, concerning the numbers, and we worked together with um, the ACLU and sending all the complaints that we were receiving. And that's how we actually ended up with a chart um, displaying the numbers of COVID inside the facilities. Well, as time went on, what we were hearing from the governor and from the Department of Corrections and what was actually happening with our um, loved ones was two different sides of the story. My husband actually contracted COVID-19 in the facility. And when I tell you that as much as we would like to paint a picture like our departments of corrections are doing everything possible, that is absolutely not true. I have recorded conversations of nurses um, denying care. Um, I had to call for four days to get my husband care who has a chronic asthma and he was very critical. Still to this day, they still have not told us if he was positive or if he was negative. You have men and women who are afraid to say that they have symptoms because they are placed in solitary confinement for 14 days without any care. Yes, they have a nurse that comes around daily to do their to check their vitals one time a day, but that is it. They are left there to either get well or to die. Um, I am known for just telling the truth and telling it like it is because there are 2.3 million people incarcerated in this country. And if everybody was doing exactly what they needed to do, we wouldn't be on this panel. Um, I know that right now flu season is coming. There's no medicine available right now on commissary or for from the state um, access, access sure pack where they ordered their boxes. There's no medicine. We were trying to, as an organization, prepare people for a cold and flu season because COVID is still rampant in the facilities. So they don't even have access to medicine. They don't have access to hand sanitizer. They do not have access to these things. We have pictures, we have went to our senators, we have told our representatives, we have went to the state and we have pictures from the inside of officers not wearing masks, refusing to wearing masks, recordings to prove all of our claims, but yet they're being ignored and COVID is still running rampant in our facilities. So yes, we need to purge the system. We are 137% overpopulated. When we weren't supposed to have receptions, we were. Um, the jails were sending people and they weren't being tested. So positive cases were entering into the system. And all this is documented. All this we have been documenting, following, following up on, talking to the state um, concerning these issues 
since March. I have not had a day off since March, and it's due to fighting for the families and those that are currently incarcerated here in Ohio. So what we would like to see is across the board, we would like to see a purge of the system so social distancing can be um, implemented. We would like to see the negligence um, being dealt with as far as our doctors and our nurses. I know in my husband's case specifically, five days, four to five days, I had to call the facility day in and day out to get him care. When he did receive care, he was, he was referred to his chronic care doctor, which in turn had no idea that he had COVID-like symptoms. It was not recorded or reported to that doctor. And he was put in quarantine for 14 days and we still didn't get the care that he received. So being a wife and an advocate, it gets very stressful because of the resistance that we see from the state and federal levels. You know, federal, they do a whole lot better concerning this issue, but on the state level, we're seeing a lot of resistance. We're not, the officers and those that are working there coming in and out, they're not getting the proper pay. They're not getting the proper PPE. So that raises tension between incarcerated people and officers, you know, so that's the problem that we're seeing here in Ohio. Um, some states that I'm working with, we're also seeing that. We're seeing the abuse cases rise um, because of the tensions inside of the facilities. Um, so, it, I mean, it's a lot of underlining things and a lot of things that people just don't want to have the hard conversations about, but it's the truth. And so we need to really start addressing these issues and figure out a solution to this problem because it's going to get worse due to cold and flu season coming. And we need to be proactive now. There are plans set in place, but they're not adhering. Each facility has their own um, has their own plan. And so it causes the, the, the lines of communication to be broken. So if I could say anything on this call, we have to work together um, across every state and join together to create a plan and hold these states accountable and these federal facilities accountable for being proactive to take care of our loved ones. Thank you for that, Ms. Bowman. Um, our next question is for Mr. Fisher. Mr. Fisher, many have advocated for the early release of at-risk and non-violent inmates. What challenges do prisoners face in making this happen? That's an excellent question and, and is one that seems to be um, problematic for, for the systems to handle. There really is no reason why we could not release more people. Uh, Earlier it was said, and it's, and it's been documented, that early releases of individuals from prisons does not impact negatively on crime in communities. So we could do more. Um, we have to define, there has to be a will to release people. And we have to define who is the most likely uh, who should be released. And that has to do with the medical needs, that how long before they're released. Certainly people who are six months or less before their release. There is really no reason why they could not be released, except now on the other side, except where are they going to go? Do they have a, a reasonable plan in the community? We're not gonna certainly send people to a, a home if COVID-19 is in the home. So there has to be a relationship between the, the, the prison system, parole and the community services. One of the things that is lacking in many other states is the inability to, to send somebody home early to a community support network. If we had more network halfway houses or residences that would accept ex-offenders with or without COVID, we could then release more. So the question becomes, who should, we, who should go out? People who are vulnerable, people who are early release, um, and where should they go? Could we have, one of the things that I've seen in another state is a request to, to fund more community centers for people upon release, kind of like a halfway house or even a community residence. That would be a big issue. On the other side too is parole has to be involved. Parole should be much more lenient on releasing people who qualify for whatever reason they have. Parole should also be taking a look at are we sending back for parole violation, technical violations, too many people? Why send somebody back for a technical violation, knowing what you have in your jails and in your prisons? So it could be, it, it could work far more effectively if both sides of the coin are being looked at. But I have to stress, one of the problems we've had even before COVID is where to send somebody 
who is homeless, who may have no real support system out there, who may already be 65, 70 years old. If there is no support system out in the community, it's almost sad to say, is it better to keep him where he is, where he's getting some services, or send him out to the street where there may not be any services? Right. And I think you bring up a very good point because we work often with a population that has difficulty accessing services under normal circumstances. And during the pandemic, when many agencies that often service the formerly incarcerated had to shut down, they were trying to provide services virtually, but then adding on that layer of technology in order to access those services poses even additional challenges. So it is extremely problematic. Thank you for that, Mr. Fisher. Um, our next question for Mr. Bartley. Mr. Bartley, the Marshall Project recently reported on the deaths of over 1,000 prisoners and 120,000 prisoners infected across the United States. Do you believe that these deaths were preventable? Absolutely, and it ties into what Mr. Fisher was saying. Um, there are people who are in incarcerated and many states have started issuing COVID releases. But since the pandemic began, and as of July, um, this country has only released about 2.2% of people inside of its prison system. Now, many of the people who states say they are gonna release are people with, with nonviolent crimes. But about half, maybe a little bit more than half of the incarcerated population are incarcerated for violent crimes. There's a, there are a substantial amount of those individuals who committed crimes where they were under the age of 18, where science says that their brain wasn't fully developed yet. So that's like akin to punishing someone for 20 and 30 years for a crime that he or she committed when they were just a, a teenager. But then there are another set of people who are incarcerated for, for, like I said, 10, 20, and 30 years. And the person that comes to mind is a man named Michael Heron. Uh, he's been incarcerated for 40 years, something he did at 20 years old. He hasn't had a misbehavior report with, for, within the last 15 years. And that misbehavior report that he had was something very minor that didn't even warrant any keep lock time, any confinement time in the cell. And um, right now he suffers from many of the um, many of the illnesses that make him more susceptible to catching COVID-19. But his, um, his, his bid for clemency that was before the governor had been collecting dust for years. And there's many people that fit that criteria. I could even talk about Rasan Thomas in, in um, California, he's in San Quentin. He hosts one of the most, pod, most popular podcasts in the country, Air Hustle. He's been up for clemency, he's been denied. You know, he has a stellar record. Every, almost everything this guy writes gets published, but yet he is made to languish in prison for, for years on end without knowing if they're gonna get out. And, and many of those, those men in San Quentin had came down with COVID-19 after, ha after having zero cases for at least two to three months in a pandemic because of transfer from people from Chino with over a hundred of those people were infected, they infected the San Quentin population. So that's just to show you how easy it is for someone to lose their life. So no, I don't think that states or even the, the federal government have been doing the best they can to release people. Sure, they say they was gonna release people. They say they're gonna um, um, try to limit the spread of, of this pandemic, but it doesn't happen. Where well, you see businesses are, are forced to operate at 25% on the outside, you don't see correctional facilities and prisons operating at 25% or trying to move towards that number. Um, Mr. Fisher also brought up parole, and, and it's interesting that I got a call from a woman this morning who, whose husband been on parole for four years. He haven't gotten into any trouble, but yet his, his home was raided by parole this morning, 5.30 in the morning, and he was taken to, to, to prison for having, for having fireworks in his home, for having fireworks, and he also had some ammunition. Now, when you hear ammunition, you say, oh, you have ammunition in your home, but ammunition is a misdemeanor. Fireworks is a misdemeanor. Some of them are punishable by a deaf appearance ticket and maybe even a fine. But he had his, his brother that was staying with him for three months that works for Brinks and it belonged to him. But yet this person has to sort this out 
And while he's the only, he, he's the main breadwinner winner in the family, then his wife has to worry about paying rent and have to worry about him catching COVID-19 or because the, the, the parole, uh, uh, they, they got past the let's wait because of the coronavirus and not lock people up, not send people to prison for minor offenses or even technical violations. Now they felt that they're past that and it's almost going back to business as usual. So once again, no, I don't think states are doing everything they can. Do you think that there's a concern about releasing um, individuals back to the community if there's no services available for them? Is that dangerous? Yes, that is a concern. Like some people are, are homeless and they figure, oh, you're going out, you don't have any place to stay and you might go in a shelter and the shelter is over, over packed and then you're in the same situation you were when, when you were incarcerated. But, but I counter that by saying there are many people who aren't in that situation. Uh, the, the, usually the people who are in that situation many times, those are people who have the nonviolent crimes who are being considered for release. But there are some people who, who have family members that come visit them on, on a weekly basis who care about them, or like Ms. Chastity Bowman make calls all the time on their husband's behalf, but yet because these people have violent crimes that they committed maybe 20 years ago and they did a 180 from that person they were, they're not even considered for release for fear of a backlash you would have. You letting a violent felony offender out. You know, sure, if you let people out, there might be some people that backslide and commit crime, but that's a small percentage when you look at the people who don't backslide. But why throw the baby out with the bathwater? Thank you, Mr. Bartley. Um, and then a question for Ms. Bowman. Ms. Bowman, one of the issues that you've highlighted um, is what you see as a lack of transparency um, and also communication from the Ohio prison system. Can you identify what changes you would like to see instituted, particularly if you had one change that you would like to see done within the next 30 days, what might that change be? The communications between families and um, loved ones incarcerated. We often spent, we spent $3 per phone call and our video visitation because we don't have visits. Um, so our video visitation is very distorted and it, it causes a lot of panic with families, especially if whether on the outside or inside someone's sick or, the, or they're sick on the inside, the, the communication is very bad. And that's something that we've been pushing for, like at least give us good communication. You know, so within the next 30 days, like we would like to be able to have a phone call and not spend 20 minutes saying, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Or paying for a video visitation for 15 minutes and you only get two minutes and then it shuts off or they don't bring them at all to the visit. So, um, so we're losing out on money that way as well. Now in Ohio, were the prisoners given access to free calling cards during the pandemic or reduced prices for video visitation? Like I know was done in many New York correctional facilities. Yes, we were given two free five minute phone calls a week. It's iffy if we'll get them. Um, sometimes we do, sometimes we may get one, sometimes we may not get them at all. Weeks will go by. It's just, it's kind of up in the air. Um, and then we were also given one free video visitation per week. And then they reduced the price to $3 and 50 cents, um, for 15 minutes. But like I said, it's each facility has their own, um, protocol. So some of the facilities are allowing, um, the video visits to take place on the, on the, on the range in the, in the pods. Um, some facilities have to take them down to the visitation room, which that actually is really a high risk for contamination still um, with COVID in the facilities. So there's a, there's a huge disconnect or a huge disconnect, even though we do, we have seen these, this relief, it, it has to be a working system in order for us to be able to utilize it. So. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Um, is Ohio have any plans for opening up to visitation? Um, that you've heard? Well, they tried it in four facilities just as a test run a couple of months ago, but we are back shut down because the, the numbers are, are back up. Okay. Um, we aren't doing any mass testing or trace testing right now um, in the facilities. So it's, it's kind of up in the air with a visitation at this, at this time. Got it. 
Mr. Fisher, I believe that the New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision has started opening up visitation. Uh, do you know how that's been going so far? Oh, Mr. Fisher, you're muted. Yes, it's, it's working rather well, but not enough. And again, it, it, it raises an issue that uh, Mrs. Bowman and, and others have, have kind of raised. And that has to do with the emotional impact this virus has, a, has happened on staff and, and prisoners and family so that every little thing that we could do to um, alleviate the tension, to be better informed about what was going on is a positive approach. Visitation is excellent, it, it's, it's necessary, but it also creates the additional problem of testing. Are we gonna be testing people who follow a visit, after a visit? So we're back to what's our plan? What's our strategy for moving forward on dealing with the issues that we've already raised, communication, testing, um, surveillance, uh, contact, contract, uh, contact tracing. We are moving in the right direction, but historically correctional systems are slow. They're not transparent. And they are ten, it has a tendency to do pretty much a little bit of everything, depending on where they are, what facility they are, and, and what kind of management you have in each of those facilities. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. And thank you to our, our three panelists. Uh, we appreciate it, Mr. Bartley, Ms. Bowman, uh, Mr. Fisher. Thank you so much for your um, insight. Uh, one of the populations too that I think we also need to be specifically concerned about, and Mr. Fisher did talk about this earlier, um, are our women who are incarcerated, um, who pose particularly are high risk for COVID because of their high rates of physical illness, because of pregnancy and other things. And they're also often invisible in the criminal justice system. They tend to be the least underserved because of the fact that they make up so, such a small percentage of the population. So I think that's one of the things that we wanna be cognizant about as we move forward uh, during this pandemic. So thank you to everyone. And we're gonna welcome back our panelists, uh, Dr. Venters and uh, Mr. Austin, and of course, Dr. Williams, thank you so much. Um, at this point, we are gonna be taking questions from our audience. So I am just waiting to see where the questions are from our audience. Hang on one second. Okay, thank you. Um, so our first question um, for either Mr. Bartley uh, or Ms. Bowman, how available is PPE in prisons? How is it used and who has access to it? That, that's a tough one because it, it varies um, by state and varies by institutions. Uh, some states are quicker than others and they were started with the elderly population and other states have started giving it to, to all people. It, it's similar to the way we are tested on the outside with the swab in the nose. Um, but but I've heard, I heard instances where one state said they was gonna test everyone interested, but they got to about a third of the population and then they didn't test. Um, but that can be due to the lack of resources and, and the lack of testing materials as well. Thank you very much. Um, our next question, and anyone can chime in to answer, but maybe Mr. Fisher, this might be a question for you. Uh, what can be done about correction officers who do not wear masks? Oh, you're muted, Mr. Fisher. You may. There you go. It comes down to what are, what are the policies that are being formulated by the central administrations across the states. Clearly, masks should be required. However, we have the problem here in America and in the community that there are people who don't agree with wearing masks. Masks should be mandated. They should be mandated for all staff and they should be mandated for all prisoners. That It's clear that use of masks will uh, certainly prevent the, um, the virus from spreading. 
So my position is masks should be mandated. Now, if you make it a rule, the question then becomes, what do you do for those officers and, and prisoners who refuse to wear a mask? And that's where it comes back to what is the policy? What does the, the agencies want to do with both um, incarcerated people as well as the staff when they are not following the rules? Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Uh, Ms. Bowman, one of our questions is from the audience. What isn't being talked about enough? What do you think we should be talking more about that we're not addressing at this point? That the issue is not resolved. Um, we are, even though time is passing and it's COVID has become so normalized that we're kind of getting away from it. And the issue is not yet resolved in the facilities. And it's one thing that I say everywhere I go, as long as there's COVID in prisons, it will always be in our communities. And so we have to truly get a buckle down. I mean, 2.3 million people, that's a lot of people. And so if we do not tackle this problem now and keep it fresh in the minds of the public and how it affects them, because a lot of times people disassociate themselves with prison because they don't have anybody that's, they're not directly impacted by it. So it's out of sight, out of mind when it really is a state of an emergency. It is a public health crisis. And if we don't do something about it, COVID will always be in our communities as long as it's in the prisons. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Uh, our next question is for Dr. Venters. Dr. Venters, in reference to the positive tests, what percentage of the people who test positive are actually sick? And do you find that many are asymptomatic? Yes, uh, like in the community, um, it really depends on how we approach testing. So in places that, uh, particularly in the early days where most people who were getting sick uh, weren't even tested, the only people getting tested were the sickest folks. So they were very symptomatic, they were very ill. Uh, as time went on and testing expanded um, with contact tracing and even uh, now uh, testing whole groups of people, um, you have a lot of people that when they're tested don't have symptoms. But one thing I want to point out is there are a lot of people who have positive tests um, who were sick weeks and months earlier, but the prison or jail or ICE detention system didn't respond to their sick call, didn't find them or give them the care they need. They have medical records now that say asymptomatic, but the fact is they were ill uh, and the system simply didn't respond to them when they, when they needed help and care. Um, so as the testing expands, just as in the community, we have more people uh, who have uh, positive tests, but who are asymptomatic. Thank you. Our next question uh, is for Mr. Austin. Uh, Mr. Austin, since COVID began, how have the courts responded regarding compassionate release, especially given the new procedural changes from the First Step Act? Have the courts been generous in granting compassionate release to those who are at risk or have they been hesitant? So I think like every, every other answer to every other question, it, it really depends. Uh, courts and judges and everybody else have been all over the place. I actually have a client who was released early, uh, who, had, um, who was concerned about COVID, uh, released uh, approximately two months early, but only had a, a sentence of about, about seven months. Um, I, I think the you know, the, the issue is, is that compassionate release and like everything else in our, in our criminal justice system, there's an enormous amount of discretion. Uh, we were also fortunate enough to have a, an assistant United States attorney on the case who was uh, thoughtful and, and recognized that this person did not need to be in that, in that setting uh, and was willing to, um, to not fight uh, the, the early release. So it, it, it simply depends. And, and this is again, um, and I, I think People have asked kind of what, what can they possibly do about this? And, and the thing is to vote, is to vote. Put people in office who actually uh, care about criminal justice reform, who care about uh, the human beings that we lock up in these facilities. Um, vote both at the, at the presidential level, but also at the state and local level. I mean, that having a reform-minded district attorney matters. Uh, having a sheriff who gets this issue matters. Uh, so don't vote law and order, vote common sense and vote humanity. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Uh, Dr. Williams, since compassionate release is really your area of expertise, can you provide additional insight on this question? 
Sure. I mean, uh, I would agree with everything uh, that Mr. Austin just said. I'd also say that um, the information I'm going to give you is from the Families Against Mandatory Minimums, um, which is a legal organization that helps to represent people uh, requesting compassionate release on the federal level. And uh, they tell me that in 2019, 145 cases of compassionate release were approved from January through February of this year before the outbreak, 22 were approved. And in total this year, since January, uh, over the past six months, 1,500 have been approved. So unfortunately, what we're still seeing is that there are more no's than yeses in compassionate release requests. The other thing to know is that these are federal requests. And so we don't have the First Step Act that applies to the states. And we have different policies depending on what state you're in. And certainly if you're in a jail, there's still another set of le local um, legislation. But just to say that one of the biggest um, and most important things that we need right now are physicians to sign up at FAM, the Families Against Mandatory Minimums, and agree to do these um, compassionate release evaluations for free. Um, and you are able to uh, link to their website at FAMM and uh, sign up. So I would, I would encourage anybody who's in healthcare uh, to do so. Thanks. Thank you for that information and for that important resource. Um, our next question um, could go to Dr. Venters or Dr. Williams. Um, are prisoners tested before release? What are you seeing um, in where you're, you've been working and the places maybe that you've been visiting? Is there testing being done regularly before folks are released back into the community? Um, I'll just say the places yeah. I've seen um, the, Bureau, the Federal Bureau of Prisons has uh, largely adopted a test in, test out model. Um, sorry about my video. Um, so the Federal Bureau of Prisons has adopted the test in, test out model where people have tested both on the way in and also on the way out generally. Um, state prisons, many of them have not adopted this, um, but it's very patchy with state prison systems and obviously with jails also. So um, I would say that probably half the places I have looked uh, state and federal prisons have um, implemented testing for people on the way out. It's also very tricky because people aren't always just going home. So if they're going to a halfway house, halfway houses mandate often and there may be private vendors or partners. So there's a whole patchwork, not only of uh, opportunity to get tested on the way out, but things that can slow you down or jam you up as you're trying to get out or go home or go out of the facility. Thank you, Dr. Venters. Dr. Williams, do you want to add to that? I really don't have anything to add. Patchwork oh. is, a, is a very good description. Okay, thank you. The next question is actually for you, uh, Dr. Williams. Uh, the question is, can you talk about the way COVID-19 has impacted the older population and what solutions have been implemented in regard to this specific at-risk incarcerated population? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. And again, I would again remind everybody that there are over 5,000 places of detention across the United States. And so every place is like its own little fiefdom. It has different rules and regulations. Every state, federal prison, local jail jurisdictions have different, um, different policies and procedures. Uh, I like this question a lot because as we know very clearly, um, advanced age is by far the biggest risk um, of ICU placement and mortality among people uh, who are exposed to and develop COVID-19. Um, I think the most important thing here, again, is release. We need some very brave political leaders who are willing to take an honest look at the extraordinarily low recidivism rates, in some case around 3% among older adults who, some of whom have hurt, served decades for violent crimes. Because it turns out when the people who are most at risk of serious morbidity and mortality from COVID-19 are often the very same people who are not getting out due to indeterminate sentences, you know, 10 to life, 15 to life, and nobody wants to sign off on them getting out. But they are actually also the people with the lowest rates of recidivism, and many have the most uh, family and community supports to ease their reentry. So it feels to me like the most important thing we can do in the community is give political leaders and policymakers some political cover to say that we really a groundswell of support to say that we understand that right now, public safety and public health are entwined. Um, as one of the panelists said, we're not gonna get control of this pandemic until we get control of it in the prisons and we're not gonna get control of it in the prisons until we get some people out. 
I'd say the other really important thing for older adults that uh, people are doing now is, and this is devastating, but it's the truth and it's the right medical practice, which is clarifying next of kin and advanced medical decisions. Mm -hmm. um, asking patients what's important to you, what makes life worth living, what would be a state worse than death so that if you are not able to make medical decisions for yourself, somebody knows what medical decisions you would want and somebody knows what next of kin you would want to be making medical decisions for you so that your wishes are being, are being um, kept and followed in community hospitals. It's a devastating time for older adults in prisons. Thank you, that's very important information. Appreciate that. Um, our next question is for Mr. Austin. Uh, Mr. Austin, is it a federal civil rights violation to fail to provide a safe environment and basic health care for the incarcerated? So I would argue yes, but uh, you know the, the uh, issue here and, and in so much of the, the work that's done in, prison in prisons and jails is that the, the law has not always followed the, again, the, the common sense of these issues. So um, you have basically a, 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 the idea of failure to keep from harm. And so to keep people in a situation where they're likely to contract COVID-19 um, would certainly be a failure to keep from harm. I, I actually think the, the best place for this argument to be made, um, but unfortunately they don't cover the Bureau of Prisons is the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division um, under an administration that actually cares about civil rights. Uh, because it would look at these issues and would, uh, I suspect that it would look at what is done at the Bureau of Prisons and find a violation, but it is not allowed to look at federal facilities, uh, but it could look at state facilities and you know, where you have state facilities where you have massive outbreaks and a failure to actually ensure that people are safe. I think you would find a, a violation. Now that's a civil violation, which just requires the prisons and jail to fix the problem, which doesn't do a whole lot when your loved one uh, dies due to COVID in a, in a prisoner jail. And I, I've yet to see a, a case brought um, like that, but I would like, I would like to see someone do that and, and bring that kind of case and, and maybe uh, finding uh, that the prison is responsible for the death of an individual might get some people to change their ways. Thank you. Are you going to represent them on that case? You know, let's, um, <laughs> let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Thank you. Uh, our next question for Mr. Fisher. Um, how can we push for action to decarcerate? Well, I think the answer has been ex expressed several times by the, my colleagues here, and that is get people to vote for people who want to make those changes. What's missing, and, and I've done this, I've, I've mentioned this at other places. Um, in many, many cases, the prison system is a reflection of the political system. The, your wardens and your commissioners, they, they don't make the, the sentencing rules. They don't make the rele release rules. They don't do a lot of those things. It comes from the legislature. It comes from the governors and it comes from the federal government. If you wanna change the system, you've gotta change the law. If you wanna change the law, you've gotta change who, who are making the law. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Um, our next question, which I think any of our panelists could answer, uh, why do you think prison systems have been so slow to release people who have underlying conditions but pose little to no risk of reoffending? I think it's just really a it, it's really just an issue of budgeting, to be honest. I, I think it's 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 really more of a money issue than anything. In the 2019 annual report, um, Ohio Department of Corrections, and you can look at this on their page, 15,000 people are considered high risk. So they knew going in that 15,000 people were at risk um, by CDC guidelines for COVID. And for us, we were advocating, just give us those 15,000 people. They're elderly, they fall under all the guidelines, and we don't like to make a difference in between violent and nonviolent offenders because studies have shown that, non, uh, that violent offenders are less likely to reoffend than nonviolent offenders. And in our state, we have the population of 49,000 people that are incarcerated. 33,000 are considered violent. And that could mean anything. That could mean you got caught with a gun, but you didn't shoot anybody, but you're a violent offender. So um, when, we, when we say like, as far as release, we try to just keep the lines 
no gray lines, no gray areas because they're all people. Yes, we know that some people just deserve to be in prison. Yes, they do. We, we know that, you know, but we also know that, um, that there are some people that could receive better care at home. And we're just asking for those people, elderly and elderly, sickly people who can help deter this virus. Those are the people that we are asking for. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Does anyone else want to add? I'd like to add that. Be one of the reasons why parole releases nationally are often low is unfortunate media coverage when someone is, is released, who should be released, and unfortunately commits a second crime. Suddenly, it becomes the, the, the celebrity, it becomes a headline. Again, we have to kind of change our attitude towards incarceration. We have to change our attitudes towards release. We have to change our attitude toward criminal justice. And until we do that, until the public and the media, frankly, uh, get on board with being more humanistic, we're gonna see people denied out of fear that something would go wrong and they will get blamed for it. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Uh, Mr. Bartley, quick question. Um, part of your responsibilities include telling stories from the inside. Uh, has the pandemic impacted your ability to be able to do so? No, it hasn't. Actually, it increased our ability to do so. People who are incarcerated have amazing stories. And, and, and I've learned through my incarceration, sometimes when you're going through something that's really emotionally challenging, that's the best time to write. It makes for the most beautiful pieces. And people from the inside have penned one of the most, some of the most beautiful pieces I've seen based upon their pain. Um, there was one person who wrote from his, his cell is right across from a death row cell and just watching how the pandemic played out on his gallery and how it affected the thoughts of people who are on, on death row. There was another man who, who wrote and, and he was basically challenging the public and saying that no, your, 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 your coronavirus lockdown is not like it is when you're locked down inside of a prison. And he just goes on and explains it. And some people write about their experiences with being released during the time of COVID and have to go, go home to family members who, who may have succumbed to the virus and or who may have been struggling with the virus at the time while this person is dealing with everything new about being home in a community, finding a job, et cetera, et cetera. So no, it actually enhanced our ability to report those stories. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bartley. Uh, Mr. Austin, what are some lessons that were learned by the first COVID wave that can be instituted in an expected second wave of COVID this fall and winter? Well, well I, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge the premise of the question is that the lessons were learned. Um, <laughs> I think we, we actually saw um, the problems um, and hopefully someone is going to, to take care of this. And, you know, first and foremost, we, we have to uh, stop incarcerating people who don't need to be incarcerated. We need to uh, look at people who've been incarcerated a ridiculous amount of time um, and look toward releasing those people. We have to look at our definition of recidivism. I know that we've talked about, you know, people get out and, and commit again, but the vast majority of recidivists are people who commit some minor technical violation of their probation or parole and are then reincarcerated. We have to think about the humanity of those who are locked up and whether or not it really makes sense to keep them locked up in a pandemic where we are sentencing people who had a term of years, we're sentencing them to die. And that's crazy and inhumane. And so I, I think that, and look, we have to clean these facilities. We talked about masks, uh, mandatory masks for guards. Um, we have to figure out ways to allow social distancing where possible, even in a prison and jail that does not require uh, the equivalent of solitary confinement. Uh, there's so much we have to do, but look, this is, this is a population of people that we have constantly um, violated their rights as human beings. Uh, we have constantly ignored their needs. And so the fact that we're doing so now in a pandemic where, where people who um, consider wearing a mask some form of rights violations um, is not surprising that we would treat uh, those who are struggling the most among us uh, the worst. So let's, uh, again, 
taking the premise of your question and, and flipping it, 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 let's learn some lessons and do the right thing the next go around. Thank you, Mr. Austin. So that concludes um, our questions from our audience today. I just wanna see if anyone has any last thoughts that they would like to share. I would like to share this and um, I would like to, for it to be a takeaway to Thank those you. who are on here and they're not directly impacted and they have so many, concern, many concerning questions about releasing individuals back into society and they may oppose to it. So my question I would like to ask you to think about the worst thing that you've ever done in your life. And then think about somebody reminding you of it every single day and not offering you any grace from the worst thing that you've ever done. Just think about that because that's what people who are incarcerated, that's what they go through every day and after. So when we say, why are we releasing people? Because it's just the humane thing to do. It's the right thing to do. Um, and I think that we all need to really kind of humanize ourselves and just think about if this was your brother, your uncle, your father, because in my organization, there are fathers that died at 78 years old. The state did not tell the family until they had already been dead for 30 days. That is unheard of. And so I think that we all need to take a step back, humanize ourselves just a little and humble ourselves and give those that are incarcerated and their families a little bit of grace, just a little bit. So that will be my takeaway from all of this. Thank you for sharing that, Ms. Bowman. Is there anyone else who has a final thought that they would like to share? It was an extraordinary place to end. Yes, thank you. So thank you to all of our panelists. Um, I think this was extremely informative. And the question that it really leaves us with is what can community members do to address this situation? You know, to protect those who are living behind the bars, to protect those who are working behind the bars, it's something that we need to be more concerned with and it's something that we need to address. Um, whether we think we're affected by it directly or not, it is something that indirectly affects every single one of us. So thank you all for being here. I really appreciate your time and thank you to everyone who participated tonight. Uh, before we close, I'm gonna bring it back to Dr. Brent Glass. Thank you, Dr. Glass. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Calico Cox. And I just want to uh, express the thanks from the, from the Sing Sing Prison Museum to all the panelists. This has been an extraordinary uh, discussion and it really fulfills our goal to be, for the museum to be part of the national conversation on criminal justice reform. I wish we had another uh, session with, uh, with our panelists because it was so thoughtful and so impressive and um, please join us on October 13th when we will have a, a screening and a discussion of True Justice, which is the story of Brian Stevenson and his um, work on uh, racial injustice and the death penalty. Uh, and we'll, you'll learn more about that on our website. Uh, I would just like to say that the, uh, unfortunately this, this problem with uh, COVID is not history. Uh, it is still part of our uh, of our uh, national uh, discussion, our national concern. And uh, we hope that we are able to contribute in a small way to enlightening the people who uh, participated. And, uh, and um, our thanks again to our panelists. This was recorded, so uh, you can go to our website and, and uh, revisit some of, these, uh, some of this discussion. So thank you and good night.